we were discussing Mosbauer spectroscopy. And last day, we have discussed two important parameters. One is the isomer shift and one is the quadrupolar splitting. So I would like to go through that one more time just to ensure that all of you are following it properly. So don't need to remember anything or memorize anything. Just try to follow the logic how we are actually doing that. So first of all, for Mosbauer spectroscopy, we are changing the nuclear state. So taking 57 iron as an example, we are coming from an excited state and coming to the ground state. Excited state is 3 by 2. Ground state is I equal to half. And over there, we are releasing gamma ray. And this energy will be captured by a sample. So this is the source. And then there will be sample which will capture the energy. Now, as you have discussed, depending on the S electron density, there can be directly go inside the nucleus for a finite time and can modify the energy of the nuclear state. So that's why in a sample and source, the ground state and excited state may not be exactly at the same state. So when we are trying to go from the similar I equal to half to I equal to three half energy gap, that energy gap may not be the same energy gap. Okay. It might be totally different energy gap. So let me put in a different color. So that is can be happening or it can also happen that the energy gap is actually shrinked down. Either of that can happen. And at the end, these are the samples. And you can see the energy gap is not actually the same. While you are running this experiment, we are doing something called recoilless condition or recoilless transitions which is actually the invention of Rudolf Mosbauer, from whom we actually got this name of Mosbauer spectroscopy. And this recoilless transfer ensures that we have enough overlap so that we can see the signals properly. However, the energy is not matching properly. And over there, we can use the similar Doppler effect to ensure that the energies match. And for that, what happens, we actually keep our sample and detector stagnant and move the source towards or far away from the sample. And by that, we actually match the energy gap. And depending on that, we can actually get the following different kind of spectral data. So Y axis is transmission percentage. X axis is velocity by which I am actually moving my source towards or far away from the sample. So towards is actually going to give you a positive number. Far away is going to give you a negative number. And at point time, you will get zero. So if this energy gap over here is perfectly matches with the energy gap with the sample, what you are going to get a signal like this, where it will be perfectly at zero point. But if it is higher in energy, like in this case, you have to move it to give it a positive Doppler effect so that the energy can match. Or if it is a lower energy, like in this case, you have to move it away from this sample so that the energy can match. And depending on that, these kind of signals you are going to get. So over here, you can see where the sample should be with respect to source. It totally depends on the energy gap difference. And this gap of the energy gap difference, whatever the number you are getting, we put it as delta or isomer shift. So this isomer shift is nothing but the actual value on this velocity scale, which is going to give you a relative energy with respect to the source. So it is very much important. And a lot of you have the question, so how do I know where is the zero? It's totally dependent on the what is the source you are using. So source is very much important over here. And we can have two different sources regularly used. 
majorly it is used the metallic iron and sometime it is used sodium nitroprusside solution one of them is actually used so metallic iron is the majorly used so when are you actually doing and recording a graph of mosbus spectra you have to mention what is actually your source otherwise people might not know and people might use a totally different source and can have a totally different number so that is why you have to mention what is your source during the experiment and if somebody else is doing with the same source they should get a similar result but if they use a totally different source they are going to get a totally different numbers of isomership the overall trend can be same but the numbers will be different okay and this delta value the isomer shift or chemical isomer shift it's actually can be expressed by this particular equation into chi zero square of sample minus chi zero square of the source okay so over there this is the full equation and over there there are few of the variables are there so from sample to sample if i'm using the same source so this is going to be a constant so that is why the source is very much important because if i change the source this particular value will be different so if i use the same source this value will be constant the rest of them are constant this is actually a value which shows what is the change in the radii from the excited state and the ground state so now the excited state of iron is actually smaller compared to the ground state so delta r by r is actually a negative term it's a negative number okay so all the things now all together the sample is going to be differed with respect to this value chi square zero uh, chi zero square sample which is giving you the possibility of a electron density inside the nucleus for the sample so that is the only thing it is going to be changed so it can be a higher number it can be a lower number so this is the only thing it is going to change the rest of them are constant so what can happen so if your chi is zero square sample but it means the s electron density inside the nucleus it can increase or it can decrease so these are the two different possibilities right so case number 1 if the chi zero square value increases what is going to happen if it increases so this number over here is going to increase this is a constant this is a negative number so what will happen this is going to be subtracted from this source value and then multiplied with a negative number and this is actually a very high value if it the uh, chi zero square value increases that means the in the sample it loss of s electron density is present there and has a chance to go inside the nucleus so it is going to be a higher number which is multiplied with a negative number because delta r by r is a negative number so all together what is going to happen with the isomer shift or delta value it is going to be on the negative side doesn't mean to be a negative number all the time because it depends on what is the source value you are using but what is going to happen if i slowly increase my s electron density what i am going to see is that this value is going to increase the chi zero square sample minus chi zero square source multiplied with the negative number so my number is going to sh shift towards the negative side okay and case 2 what happens if my chi zero square sample value that means s electron density value decreases if this value now decrease what will happen if this value decrease and i am multiplying with the negative number that is going to shift on the positive side okay so these are all relative terms negative and positive what i am saying these are all relative terms so it shows that which side i am going to move from sample to sample because in mosbus spectroscopy we generally compare with different samples so either i am looking in oxidation state spin state change so over there what my final goal is to find 
what is the change in the AC electron density? If it is increasing, then this overall, this whole value will increase and altogether it is multiplied with the negative number. So all the things will move towards the negative side. OK, and the other possibility is that my AC electron density is decreasing. And at that point of time, this value is going to decrease and multiply the negative number, so it will shift towards the positive side. So that is the whole point we have to kind of follow to find out how the oxidation state or spin density or uh, sorry, the spin state is going to control my isomer shift or delta value. So the next thing is that we have covered this thing in last class. I'm going to do that one more time. Case number A, say if you have an iron plus three system versus the iron plus two system. First, I'll find out what is the electronic configuration. This is a D5 system. This is a D6 system. So this has much more higher D electron density. It has a lower D electron density. What will happen? with respect to the shielding effect. Shielding means how the D electron is going to shield the S electron density from interacting with the nucleus. So more the D electron, more will be the shielding effect. Less the electron, less will be the shielding effect. So this less or more, it is comparative term only between this iron three and iron two, I'm considering, okay? So if I also give you iron one versus iron five, you have to compare like which iron states I'm talking about and between them, which is having more D electron density. So it is not actually absolute term, but a relative term. Okay. So shielding effect says that it iron three plus has less shielding, iron two plus has more shielding. So what will be happening? Chi zero square sample value, which is nothing but three S electron density. Because we have already discussed that it is 1s, 2s, and 3s. These three condition the electrons can go inside the nucleus for the iron. And among them, 3s is actually most closely controlled by the 3d because they all belong to the valence shell. 1s and 2s in core shell, so their effect is very minimal. So this 3s elect electron density, which is going to have more chance to go inside the nucleus. It is going to be the iron plus three because less shielding, so the ACE electrons are free to interact with the nucleus. So chi zero square is going to have a higher value and this is going to have a low value. Again, these are all relative term between iron three and iron two. If I change the oxidation state, this relativity can change. Now I'm going to multiply delta R by R. This is going to be a negative term for both of them because this is a constant value. What is the change of the ionic radii for iron when it is excited state versus down state when the nuclear state is going to be i equal to 3 by 2 versus i equal to half and nuclear radii we are actually talking about so it is going to be negative so altogether what will be the isomer shift value then so you can see it is a negative value multiplied with a higher term so it is going to be a, on the negative side on the, this hand, it is negative value with a lower value. So it is going to be on the positive side. OK, so higher is the oxidation state. Slowly, the delta value isomer shift will go towards the negative side. Lower is the oxidation state. It is going to move towards the positive side of the isomer shift. OK, that is going to happen as you are changing the oxidation state. The next thing we have discussed is the spin state. Now say I have a low spin iron versus a high spin iron. Now over here we try to find out what will be the relative uh, condition for the isomer shift, which direction it will move. So again, we are going to look into the system regularly. So it will the system differs between low spin and high spin with respect to the ligand. Generally, for low spin, it has to be a pi accepted ligand. For high spin, it is generally a pi donor or it can be also only sigma donor ligand is also possible. No pi donation at all. 
but we are actually not considering this at this moment. So we are considering pi donor ligand and pi acceptor ligand so that we are a very good uh, strong field ligand in this case or very weak field ligand in this case. Now, if this is happening, what is the molecular picture? So this is a metal present with a ligand and it is pi accepting ligand. So that means a pi star orbital of the ligand is active. And over there, I am having a d pi p pi interaction where the electron density is going out from the d towards the ligand. Whereas in the pi donor ligand orbital, generally a pi orbital comes over here. What happens? The electron density over there is going from this side. In this way, it comes to this cell. So this is also a d pi p pi interaction. But over there, the electron density comes from the ligand to the metal side. So electron density is moving this side. Now over here, the rest of them is same. D electron density. What is going to happen? Which side is going to be higher D electron density? It is going to be the high spin because you are taking more D electron density out of the ligand. Over here, consider at this moment the oxygen state are same. So we start with the common D electron before you start with the interacting with the ligand. But once it's interacting with the ligand, this pi donor is getting more electron density back towards the metal. So the D electron density is going to be higher, more electron density in the D orbital. Whereas the pi acceptor ligand, it is going to remove some electron density towards the ligand. So it is actually going to lose some D electron density. Then the rest of them are very same as the last time what is going to happen with respect to the shielding effect. Less d electron density, so it will be low. High d electron density, it will be high. What is going to happen with the psi zero square sample? That means it is nothing but the 3s orbital interaction with respect to the nucleus. So it is going to be actually a high value because it has more chance because it is having less hindrance from the d electron density before it can interact with the nucleus. And this is going to be a low number for this. Delta R by R, it is always negative for R and 57. So what will happen to the delta value? So this is a high value multiplied with the negative terms. So it will be on the negative side. It's a low value multiplied with the negative term. It is going to be on the positive side. So if you consider the same oxidation state, but you are changing only the <coughs> ligand interaction, high spin versus low spin, low spin is always going to be on the negative side, high spin is always going to be on the positive side. Again, don't need to remember everything, just logically think what has happened to the S electron density and how the S electron density is modulated by the D electron density with the shielding effect. Okay, so this is what is going to happen with respect to the isomer shift, with respect to the spin state and oxidation state. The next thing we discussed about the quadrupolar splitting. We have discussed in detail, so today I'm just taking the gist of it. So to see a quadrupolar splitting, what do you need to have? Two things. First, your nucleus have to have a quadrupolar moment active. That means EQ should be not equal to zero. And it is only going to happen if your state is greater than half. So it is only going to happen for iron 57 when you're talking about the excited state where the I equal to three by two. When you're talking about the ground state, I equal to half. So over here, EQ is zero. So only the excited state can actually vary and create a quadrupolar moment. Second condition, you should have a electrical field gradient. That means the electrical field around the nucleus should be asymmetric or inhomogeneous. And this is known as electric field gradient or EFG and that should be equal to non-zero value. 
and this actually comes out with two different condition first one is the lattice contribution which says that the ligand when it is surrounding the atom it should be in an symmetric manner for an example octahedral geometry square planar geometry they are all or spherical geometry they are all symmetric distribution so in this conditions you will see a lattice contribution uh, don't see a lattice contribution but if it breaks down that symmetry you will see a lattice contribution for an example if you have a tetrahedral geometry you will have a lattice contribution in an octahedral geometry if you change one of the ligand you go to c4 v symmetry you are going to see a lattice contribution the second one is called the valence contribution it depends on how the electrons are actually distributed around the system so if you start with a very simple octahedral geometry and say my symmetry is t2g3 eg0 so over there t2g3 is a symmetric arrangement of electrons around the nucleus so it is not going to be contributing to the valence shape however if it is t2g3 eg1 it is going to contribute now say if you have a t2g6 eg0 it is not going to contribute to valence contribution if you have a t2g6 eg2 it is not going to contribute t2g3 eg2 they are not going to contribute so these are very symmetric system which are not going to contribute similarly you can think about also uh, about that uh, tetrahedral geometry e2 and t2 zero it is not going to contribute e2 t2 three it is not going to contribute so this kind of systems are not going to contribute because they actually surround the electron around the molecule in a symmetric manner so the electric field which is going to be generated will be very symmetric so it cannot create a gradient but any deviation from this it will contribute to there and the valence contribution can kick off okay so two contribution lattice and valence contribution